Mahalo, lovely dance people, and welcome to David's Dance Podcast. I'm your host, David Evans. Um, we have an incredible dancer here with us on the podcast. Um, she is an amazing uh, voga and contemporary dancer, um, and uh, just so impressed with uh, her her ability to, uh, you know, it's so hard to be good at sort of more than one style, but she manages to be excellent at multiple um, and do it with uh, such a unique style and her sort of very articulate, very precise as, as well as serpentine kind of like approach to movement um, that is so specific to kind of her physicality and uh, really, you know, she, she manages to uh, sort of bring across her own sort of uh, personality through, through all these styles so that they feel really integrated into her whole kind of being as a, a dancer. She's doing um, incredible work um, with uh, Richard Chappell, um, who we had on the podcast uh, a few few weeks ago, um, and uh, his work Infinite Ways Home, which he talked a bit about, um, uh, she's now a part of, and um, she's also doing work with uh, Jose Ogundo, um, uh, which uh, is amazing. Uh, we're excited to talk to her about. We're very happy to have her here on the podcast. Faye Stoicer, Faye, welcome. Hi. Hi. <laughs> that was a lovely introduction. <laughs> Thank Did you. Did I pronounce your name right? I should ask Faisal, you before. Yeah. So it's Faye Stoza is like my name. And then a lot of people know me as Faye Revlon, which is like my ballroom Vogue name. So, okay. How did you get your ballroom name? Um, so I'm part of the House of Revlon, the iconic House of Revlon. There you go. Um, that makes sense. Yeah, when you join a house, you take on the name of the house as well. So, yeah. Oh, cool. It's like kind of, yeah, because yeah. as like a, a last name, because are they, yeah, because it's very much kind of like almost like a family structure. So it's like kind of like taking it on like a, like a family name. And you were saying even, you know, there's like uh, each house has like a, a matron or a, a patron um, who's kind of like the, a mother or like a father who's kind of the head of the house who like looks after everybody else in uh, the crew or the house or whatever. Yeah, I mean, yeah, as you say, it's definitely like a family unit. Um, if you've seen Paris is Burning, like it is, it is what they say, it's like a family mm. or like, um, like a gay street gang. <laughs> um, yeah that's what they say. more more um, on the more west side story side yeah. of uh, street gangs <laughs> yeah. um so so yeah so that's like the house of revlon it's been open since um the 80s um 1989 so it's wow. been around yeah it started off in new york um so yeah it's quite a privilege to carry that name a name that's been around for so long and yeah. Um, yeah, there's like mothers and fathers. So in the UK, I'm the princess of the House of Revlon. Um, so it's not quite the same as a, like a mother or father figure. It's like mm -hmm. one step below. So I'm kind of like the link between like the children or the kids of the house and yeah. the mother and father. So, yeah. You're kind of <laughs> <laughs> second in command. Oh, that's quite yeah. cool. It's really yeah. interesting. Like when we talk about the the history of like, street dance and stuff because you know to us like I don't know like 40 years and you know or even 20 years in street dance terms feels like a, a, a long time um mm. and like especially because of the uh the kind of the rapid development and emergence of these forms yeah. um which really also speaks to the creativity of the communities that have developed them that so often these dance styles kind of emerged out of maybe the styles or communities that coalesced around a specific time. And then you sort of see them develop very quickly over kind of like 10 years. You know, I think of like break dancing emerging through kind of, you know, Black and Latino kids in the Bronx at that specific like crossroads of that time in the 70s, you know with you know things like the the music the soul music the the breaks coming hip-hop starting to emerge um you know watching kung fu movies and like imitating yeah. those which were kind of new to america and it's just it's like wow that thing could only really like happen in that time and place but how yeah. quickly 
they developed a, like a, a strong subculture within 10 years that then kind of like massively took, took off. And, uh, and it, it's w one of the things that, you know, I, I think probably you as well, but like, I love about street dance is just like their, these styles, their emphasis on creativity and on individuality, which just creates them all. They just become like kind of petri dishes of culture, you know, yeah. um, and cultures that emerge and develop really uh, rapidly. And uh, but also like we don't often don't have written histories because they're so like informal. So, um, yeah. you know, a lot of these aspects of like the oral history become really, really Im important. But um, that's that's like amazing. So when did when did voguing um, uh, first emerge? Well, you can actually date the very roots of um, the ballroom scene um, to like the late 1800s, actually, because it, wow. it evolved from um, pageantry. So it was like they were doing these drag shows in, um, in Harlem. And um, so it would just be a competition of like uh, drag, drag queens. And um, at one point, um, they realized that there was a lot of racism happening within these drag shows. Um, so the the black the black and Latinx um, people of this of the drag scene, they decided like no we want to do our own thing. So this was like in the sixties, and um, there's a um, someone called Crystal Labeja started to do her own balls um, that was just for black and Latinx um, people, the um, LGBT communities, and um, yeah. And the rest is history. So voguing itself didn't come about until much later. So at first it was just more about the, the pageantry. So it would be about, um, you know, who has the best outfit or like more like fashion um, sort of categories. Wow. And um, it wasn't until later on that voguing developed. And it was, I think, well, there's lots of different stories to how it started. Um, mm. As you were saying, like, it's not written down. so um it's hard to know what actually happened one story i heard was someone called paris dupree um was looking through um like vogue magazines or just um fashion magazines and started just imitating the poses to the beat of the music and that's how this whole dance style evolved um there's another story that it, it started developing in in prisons um so yeah obviously i wasn't there so i don't i don't know but um yeah, so that's how like voguing was was created, and it was the same. Like they were influenced from kung fu movies and stuff like this. Like a lot of the influences is like this martial arts kind of form. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's interesting, like seeing the crossovers between other street dancers that have had the same influence because they were yeah. happening at the same time. Um, There's yeah. always the the modeling of the eighties because I mean I don't know much about modeling, but I'm sure the like the the poses and all of that has changed changed a lot over the years especially now like now that I mean back then it was it was mostly print and some television but pretty much all modeling was for print which kind of makes it more kind of yeah. flattens it whereas most modeling these days is is for digital and uh, a lot of it is uh video based and incorporating camera angles it's for social media so i i do think in some ways like modeling has become like more kind of dynamic i think i do see more kind of dynamic kind of movement direction and in some ways it's better for dancers because it's not just like oh hit that pose and make it look good it's like hey you actually gotta um like yeah. look good kind of moving but um yeah kind of yeah amazing how it kind of merges in those in the 80s but how also these things become important expressions for these like communities as well. It becomes like a, like a lifeline and like an outlet for them to like articulate those, those experiences really. I mean, and, and now it's still very relevant. Like we still have um, racism, we still have homophobia. So yeah. it's, um, I mean, the communities in, so since it came from New York, it spread like throughout the whole world, like, we have voguing and ballroom everywhere. We have it in Russia, Europe, it's just exploded. Um, but it's still, 
it's still about community and it's still about having that safe space for mm. um, predominantly queer POC. Um, and yeah, and that's what that, that space is for. And I think before this interview, I was saying to you that I really do separate like my professional dance career from, from the ballroom scene and me voguing. I mean, naturally, because ballroom and voguing has become such a huge part of my life, for sure, it influences the way I move in contemporary and how I approach work. And it's it's definitely made me find like what I'm good at as an artist, because I think mm. this thing with um, when you freestyle, when you do like a freestyle style of dance, it is all you. So you're really like finding out what am I good at? How can I make this style work for me? Um, you're finding your weaknesses and you're like, okay, well, I don't have to do that. It's not like learning choreography where you have to do what the choreographer says. Like you are in a sense, the choreographer of what you do, which makes it so scary as well when you have to battle or something because you're presenting 100% yourself. Like you're choosing what to do in that moment. You've chosen your outfit. You've chosen like, pretty much everything the music is chosen for you usually but like it's it's really you on stage and you can't hide behind oh well the, it was the chore choreographer's choice it was like yeah it was just me out there yeah exactly and I think that's that's what makes it so special to me and also I enjoy that it's not my job like I don't want it I don't want voguing to be my job because I I, I do it for the love and I do it for the community like yeah, being part of the house, as I was saying earlier, it's really, it is a family. And these people, like, I talk to them every single day. It's really like having real biological brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers. So, so yeah. Oh, that's but so there's lovely. Def there's definitely crossovers. Like, um, I'm sure it, where, if, if you see me dance contemporary, like, you can see, oh, yeah, there's, there's a few, like, crossovers, you know, I, I have an interest in, like, movement of arms and hands, articulations, yeah. like this. Um, but, yeah, but they are separate things. Mm. And it is, is that, it is, I mean, there's a kind of a good division in some ways, because it, it's that thing of, like, one is kind of a break from the other. And I think having, it's an important thing as well for dancers to have uh, other other hobbies other other passions that are are not uh that are not your whatever your full-time dance career is um because otherwise you sort of become sick of it um you know and it, it doesn't take much actually to much of a break doing something else I find to then come back and 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 really enjoy and take lots of pleasure from dance again but I find you, you do also need need that because, um, you know, when dance becomes a career, it stops become, becoming a hobby and it does function differently. And so you do need something else sometimes to unwind pretty much. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with everything you're saying. I think like ballroom has just been such a, save, a savior for me in terms of exactly what you're saying. Um, I love dance in any form. I, I just love it. And um, but there is this thing when it becomes your job, you, you're working eight hours a day, mm. you know, rehearsing. And it's not easy. They do tell you it's not going to be easy, but I don't think you understand like how hard it is until you actually get there and you have to, you're pushing your body through all of this. It's not just on your body, it's your mind as well. And this, and this thing of, um, it's a constant, it's not a struggle, it's a constant push. Like even when you're like an established artist or dancer, you still, you know, you're still gonna get rejected at an audition or either you, and it's just continuous. It does get easier, but it's hard. It's very mm. hard. So I think having just something else that you can go to, and for me, it is ballroom and voguing. And I can feel like, you know, there's, I don't know, it's just not that pressure. Like, yes, I can lose a battle, there's a lot of pressure in ballroom, don't get me wrong. You can lose a battle and they're going to tell you right there and then like, you lost, you didn't do good, you know, and it is intimidating. But at the same time, it's a sort of a different thing. It's not like you're losing money for it. I mean, sometimes they do have cash prizes, so you can lose money from it. But it, it just feels like a different thing. And because you're choosing to do this out of the love, it, yeah, it just brings me so much joy. And as I was saying earlier, it's your expression, it's your, 
it's everything is you that you're putting out there so it's it's almost like more rewarding in a sense when you mm. actually come away and you've you've won a battle or you've achieved something within it because you're like yeah that was me that was my extra hours that I put in in my bedroom practicing like every day do you know what I mean mm. whereas I think when you do people's work or something you're always going to feel great after a performance or whatever but it's not your work necessarily unless you do like a solo or something but mm. Yeah, there's just that like extra level of like self authorship and and the creation of your your dance and your material that allows you to just own the moment more basically. Yeah. Hello, listeners. David here. If you're enjoying the podcast, hit the like and subscribe button for more content, and hit us up in the comment section. Let us know what you think about the podcast and the issues being discussed, and ask us questions that you'd like to hear about on future podcast um and maybe put in some uh, requests are there any dance artists that you want us to have on the podcast tag them in the post let us know we'd love to hear from you now back to the podcast do you find like so like my ba background was break dance and salsa and then i went to love and like did a year in contemporary dance and like worked with like contemporary dancers um like I've found that like now the way that I train is is really takes a kind of hybrid approach, you know, and in in the sense that I I find class very very useful and very important. But definitely my um my sort of b boy approach has influenced me in the sense that <clears throat> I I really see uh classes input and then I go away and I work on those things and and train them myself. Um, uh, you know, whereas sometimes I see uh, in, in the two communities, I see contemporary dancers or ballet dancers go, oh, I got to go to class in order to, to train or to work on things, or I have to have like a teacher there. And I'm like, no, 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 you got to like work on that by yourself where, you know, you can, you know, figure it out by yourself and like be dedicated and, you know, you find the bits that you need to work on. Um, and, but also I see it with, you know, break dancers and other street dancers where they're only doing things by themselves and not taking class. And like, that's a hard road because you don't have enough input or feedback to actually then develop the dance by yourself in a kind of way. So I found that like a kind of hybrid of those really works for me. Is there, is there ways in which that uh, you've learned from contemporary and, and Vogue or, or other styles that you've kind of taken away and have informed the way that you develop as a dancer? Yeah, so it's interesting because I actually started off as a studio dancer. Like I went to like a local dance school. Um, so I was always getting told what to do. And it wasn't until much later. I mean, I didn't even find contemporary until much later. And then it was after I, that I found contemporary that I started doing Vogue. And as you were saying, like this thing of being a freestyler, it is that thing of spent like I spent hours like every pretty much every day I'm going to train even if it's just for like 30 minutes or something and it is that thing of like really finding yeah practice 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 train 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 rather than just going to a class learning some choreography or whatever it is and then going away and not thinking about it I mean, even before I was voguing and stuff, I was always like someone that would come back from a class and be like, ah, oh, I didn't get that bit, so let me practice it or whatever. Um, but I think that's also why, because for a long time, I wanted to go into a commercial dance, actually. I was like, yeah, I'm going to be this like commercial dancer. And I think what made me kind of step away from that was this thing of like this fast process of like you go you learn the choreography super quick and then you have to be able to just do it like that like super quick and you you know you have to get the count straight away and then if you don't get it straight away then that's that's it you failed kind of thing and um I think when I was coming into contemporary what I liked about it more was there was more room for for being an artist and having agency over what you do like you could you could kind of change the choreo a bit to make it like yours a little bit not not always but a little bit more than commercial I felt like in commercial you had to be super clean you had to hit that count and be there 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 and so when I found contemporary I was like oh this is 
this is a bit more like what I could see myself doing. And then when I found voguing, I was like, well, this is what I've been waiting for my whole life because now I can, I have a structure and a style that I can, there's rules to it. And I like rules because I think it actually lets you be more creative is when you have rules that you then can kind of push and bend a little bit. Um, so yeah, when I was finding Vogue, I was like, okay, yeah, this is it. I, I have agency over what I do. Um, but I think working as a dancer, you do need to have both. You need to be able to pick up choreography. You need to be able to do what you've been told to do. And I think if you're going into contemporary dance, you do need to have both. You need to have your own style and flair. You need to be able to improvise or else you're just a dancing robot. And I always think there's like two different types of dancers. You get dancers that like kind of what you were saying, like you can be told what to do and you produce it and you produce it very well. Um, or you have dancers that are more like on the freestyle end or the creative end that kind of create their own thing. And I think the best thing you can do is kind of be in the middle where you can do both. Mm. Um, like for me, I think I'm quite a specific dancer. Um, I don't think I'm like super employable as a dancer. Like I'm not the best at picking up choreography. I sometimes really struggle with it actually. Um, I'm much better at um, doing my own thing. <laughs> but sometimes that doesn't work. You know, sometimes you have to do what you're being told. So. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes you have to do what you've been told. <laughs> you said that so reluctantly. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I don't know. Like, I think, I actually, well, I did uh, actually some research on this because um, I was lucky enough to be able to do my MA uh, when I was in Rombe too. Yeah. And I decided to research um, like how we learn. And I realized like that I'm quite a slow learner. Like I, I really, I take time. <laughs> I'm not someone that gets something straight away. Like I need to go home and practice it. And then, like I see with some dancers, they learn something and they kind of plateau. Whereas I, I would always be someone I'd learn it and I wouldn't be that great at it. And then as like I do more shows, say if I'm learning a piece or something, like I would just keep getting better and better and better because I would mm. dig into the movement more and more. I mean, um, a lot of that is just deep, deep learning. <laughs> it, is you're not just trying to get it at the surface level, but you're actually digging at you know at the like you say digging unpacking the choreography trying to really get into it and uh or or a movement or a phrase or whatever and unpacking on a deeper level which kind of in order to do that it might be you know you know messier or, or whatever because there's there is that kind of, that kind of thing i i don't know there's so many different ways to like learn a choreography right you know and there is certainly that thing where even if you get all the shapes the first time, like I, th I think it's, it can be like, you know, night and day compared with when you're down the line and the choreographer is fed in, uh, okay, you know, it, this bit needs to kind of flow into this, or this transition is about this image or, or this feeling or oh there's a breath here or there's an exhale there and like all that or some choreographers work the opposite way they start with the feeling and they give you the feeling and it's and then later they develop the form or articulate and refine the form so there's kind of different ways to go about it and it kind of depends on the choreographer but also like how you like to build your your own like stru chore choreographic structure in like your mind because for me I really struggle to learn choreography that is shapes like that is oh. like that is like okay here's a and here's b and here's c what well, i but i'm love the movement between the shapes that to me is like all my dancing so i always feel like my dancing doesn't photograph very well but it looks great on video because i'm like the movement between the shapes is always very good and yeah. that is always the thing that I attach to the most and really, really get into and want to get into first is how does that flow into the next thing? And so it's the kind of the dash between A and B that I kind of 
start with and then I end up and then I try and refine the other points but I know it's it's very different for everybody like everyone kind of builds it up in their head differently and um but ultimately that's good because it allows you to go like deeper with a choreography I think I'm the opposite to you I think I I like the shapes and then I have to find the flow between them (laughs) right yeah Yeah. (laughs) that's good can meet somewhere in the middle yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's dope. So is is there a it's interesting also what you say about the creativity versus do just doing things because there's those two different types of hires in the in like the dance industry where sometimes you're hired for a creative process and uh like an R and D. Um and then other times that you're you're hired for a role that's like already being cr- created. Um, I mean, certainly like I found for, for myself, actually, once I started doing choreography and performing that actually it was the creative process that I fell in love with. And actually I'm, I'm really not that fussed about learning choreography or even performing, but the, being a part of a creative process to me is like the best thing in the world. Um, Mm -hmm. and like, I totally love. And so for me, that's basically like that's why I'm there and like what I'm showing up for. So is, is there like a certain side of the coin that you prefer or like uh, do you just gravitate them for different, different reasons? It's interesting. I do actually like both and I do work in both, even though I say I struggle picking up choreography in the beginning, but sometimes, so for example, with Jose Agudo, Uh, he's very much like he gives you the steps and you learn them but I find there's something interesting interesting in that is that you can yeah like dig into someone else's way of moving so it's like you're you're pushing your body to to go outside of your normal like neural pathways if you want to put it in science terms like you're you're making new pathways yourself so I, I do enjoy that and I think because of my training from when I was a kid, I was always doing choreography. So even though if it wasn't natural to me, like I still learned how to do it. And, mm. and so I, I don't mind it. I like That's one of those ones where you like you find the shape and then you find yourself in it later almost. Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, like, for example, with Jose's work, it's um, like very flamenco influenced. And I, I, I think I like working with choreography when there's something very specific and the choreographer is like very like grounded in their own style and so that you can really like look at them and learn something new I think when the choreographer themselves is a bit like wishy-washy then for me I don't gain as much from that right Um, so you mean when there's like a specificity to their style or their way of moving yeah 100 percent but then I also work with like Richard, for example, which is more of a creative process. And I love that too, because especially with Richard, he really lets me be me. <laughs> he lets me put all the influences of voguing and, and everything in there. And um, for me, I, I'm, I love it because it's a chance for me to develop like Faye, you know, I get to develop the face style, whatever that is. Mm. And um, and yeah, obviously, you know, you can put your best bits in there. You can you can make yourself look good. Mm. Um, and yeah, I, I love being creative, but um, I will say I love performing as well. Like, actually, I'm someone, I realized this throughout my career that I, what I love about my job is performing. I actually, I don't love rehearsing. <laughs> it sounds really bad, but I just... I find it really hard. I find rehearsing um, really strenuous and I just get so tired mentally and physically. And um, I think throughout my career, I found a way of um, getting into like a flow state on stage. So like an optimum performance state. And it's like, for me, it's like magic. Like when I'm on stage, I don't know what happens. But for some reason, my body can do things that normally in a rehearsal room like I can't do. And I don't know if it's just like the state of mind or the adrenaline or whatever, but I mean, Richard even said this to me. He was like, oh, you're like the one dancer that you're so, you're so different on stage. And I don't mm. know if that's a good thing, 
It's probably, I mean, I should probably be better in rehearsals, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That might have been a note. <laughs> yeah, it's like but a noticing a quality gap. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I think something, for me, there's something so magical about it. And um, yeah. yeah, I really cherish those moments. And if, if I have a moment where I'm like, oh, work is so hard, my body hurts. I think also because I suffer from injury as well in a rehearsal I'm I'm in pain physically emotionally yeah. everything so I think those moments on stage like I don't even feel that and I'm just like <sighs> you're just in it everything. yeah so what's your what's your pre-show r- routine like or what do you mentally like doing to get into that flow state I'm sure a lot of it you're just doing naturally not thinking about it but there's certainly a way you get there like I definitely have like uh like a, a moment where before I go on stage where I just bring myself and I'm just like to own the moment and to own the stage and to even like look out to the audience and like own the audience and then just like just like give myself ownership of the space so it's almost like mentally I have to like conquer the space so that by the time I get out there the space hasn't conquered me and I'm not having to win the room mentally i i so like mentally i try to like david you've already won the room you're already here you're already present and so i don't feel like i have to go out there and like win the room out there i can just go out and just be confident and be present so uh, i find i like you know that minute 30 seconds before i'm going on stage i'm giving myself that pep talk like Mm -hmm. uh, you know what's your kind of what's your pre-game mentality like you know well it, it's definitely a ritual like it's a whole it's a whole thing that I developed over my career um and actually it's very simple it's just it's just a warm-up basically so I, I do a physical warm-up because for me if my body is warm and ready then that kind of connects to my mind um yeah. so I mean I'd be freaked out if I was about to perform and my body was cold like there's no way so I do my physical warm-up I have my headphones in And it's just um, as I'm warming up my body physically, I'm also warming up my mind, like just Mm. getting in the zone. And um, I usually go through a bit of the choreography if I'm doing choreography, just to get into the feel of the piece. And then, um, yeah, just I think just like a minute before I'm about to perform, just having a moment, like breathe. And just like really getting, usually getting into the character as well. Even if the Mm. piece doesn't have um, like a specific narrative, I'm still going to find like some sort of character within that that I can go with. And I think just like being in that character's um, kind of calms my nerves down. Because I used to go on stage and I would have so much nerves and, and adrenaline that all the rehearsal that I'd done would just go to to waste. And I would just be like, why can't I do on stage like what I would do in a in a studio so I think it was really important for me to actually have like a whole 30 minute prep to like Mm. um to get into that that space I will say like through performing repeatedly like now I've gotten quicker so actually and it's come a lot from um doing more commercial work where you're on camera and you don't always have time to do your 30 minute warm up on commercial jobs. They're just like, right, go, <laughs> you're in front of a camera. Especially this year, because there's been less um, theater work. I've done more like kind of video stuff. And um, I actually learned a lot from it, like how to just like tap into it straight away. Like you're, you have to be chatting with the director and whatever, and then boom, you have to be in a character or in the zone or in flow state. So I would say like, I've just gotten better at just get in there somehow yeah Um, and is there like a a shorthand for you for for getting there or sometimes it's also like finding the feeling before and then like I know I can jump to that feeling again and throughout the day but if I can find that feeling early on in the day it's easier for me to like re-access it if that makes sense or like yeah it's or sometimes it's doing that 30 minute warm-up like earlier and then I can come come back. I can come back to it, although I won't be like, you know, necessarily warm in the moment. Having that moment in the day does set the tone and almost feel like you can access that stuff like quicker, if that makes sense. Like, yeah, it's an interesting one, though. Like, yeah, what you're talking about and getting into that flow state and 
um i think it's interesting as well what you talk about like the like the the getting into the the character as well and also that allowing you to be confident because you're like well it's the character out there <laughs> you know um and uh, and all of that it, but it's it, it's really incredible because what you're describing is is almost like a transition into a werewolf <laughs> just like you're like here's this like whole transformative thing that i do you know but also the consistency of what you're describing is really important as well because once you get used to your routine you have faith in the routine and you have faith in your ability to be able to get into that performative state you know and even what you're talking about over this last year we're getting into it faster that builds confidence in yourself to be like oh okay i can access that performative mindset state whatever that is my flow state like faster and having that confidence just allows you to just have more confidence in the process like as as a whole and feeling more comfortable because you're less worried about how you're going to be on stage you know definitely definitely i will say it's different for um for battling though i will say i haven't actually found a good state of mind yet for battling mm. i think it's a very different thing improvising um in a battle situation where um to performing choreography i think if you have choreography you have the structure there and all you need to worry about is the execution yeah. and performing it whereas i think with with battling there's a lot of things to contend with you've got you have to improvise you have to um well in vogue we we battle at the same time as the other person so you have another person that's trying to get in your way <laughs> that you have to kind of contend with and um you have to be you have to use musicality as well so i think it's a very different state of mind but then you still need to have that presence and that that confidence um so yeah so when I find a way of, of getting in the state of mind for battling, I'll let you know. But I haven't found it yet. Have you? <laughs> yeah, no, not really. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, they're like, they're cognitively so different. They're like, even though you're dancing, like they're mentally just like completely different tasks, you know? Yeah. I find the, probably the main difference with like battling and stuff is that I'm mostly trying to tune into the music because it's like that music is going to, like that's your ride or die like you know if you're if you're not really in tune with the music and you just go out there it's like it's all gonna be off even if you're like on beat you know vibing with the music and catching that groove then i find i go out there and i can build a whole set a whole whatever like around that vibe you know but i so i that's the main thing for me whereas like i don't know stage content stage context it's or choreography it's more like often especially because that's with other people i'm tuning into the people around me um a lot um yeah that's that's probably the main difference is because like like freestyling is, is a, such a solo activity i'm so much more just like it's more of a duet with the music so i'm like vibing with the music getting into that groove whereas i think stage thing i'm like more trying to connect with the people around me uh to catch whatever vibe so as we do this whole thing together so both are tuning in but i i do find i tend to tune into different things the main thing is just you tune into something like because <laughs> it's when you're just there and you're not vibing with nothing that you're just like yeah, ah. <laughs> yeah. we've all had those battles <laughs> yeah, yeah. <Michael. laughs> but yeah no it is true what you were saying cognitively they are such different things um yeah improvising creating well you're creating movement on the spot which is completely different to remembering or yeah recalling choreography it's yeah it's a completely different thing so yeah mm. and you've had like a yeah kind of an interesting journey with your dance from what you're talking about shifting from uh, commercial through to uh, contemporary and, and and then Vogue, which is kind of interesting in like your, um, you know, what in, in your like education as well. So you did uh, London Studio as you were there for, um, was that, that was your undergrad, wasn't it? Yeah. And what yeah. was kind of your motivation for, for going there? 
or where were you in your journey at that point at that point were you very much were you still kind of hand in commercial hand in you know where were in contemporary where were you in your kind of uh dancing journey there I didn't know what contemporary was when I started Studio Centre and I never in a million years would have guessed that I would have gone into contemporary dance. Wow, really? Um, yeah, I, I always saw contemporary as this like weird thing that was never me. <laughs> um, and I like, mean, it is, it is weird, but... <laughs> it's, it's, um, yeah, I actually went to Erdang as well. I did a foundation course at Erdang. So like oh, yeah. really musical theatre, jazzy, like all of that. Like my training as a kid, I, I went to like a local dance school, did like ballet, modern, all, all of that, commercial choreography. choreography. Mm. And, um, and yeah, so I auditioned for like all of the musical theatre schools. Like I didn't even, I wouldn't have even considered going to like Laban or Rombert or anything, no way. <laughs> I wanted to do jazz and um, commercial, I think. And um, when I got to studios, so at studios, how it works is you do a bit of everything. So everyone, or when I was there, at least you, everyone does a bit of jazz, a bit of contemporary. Um, Graham, we did, that was like our main thing. Everyone does a bit of ballet. You can kind of choose to do more contemporary or more ballet or more um, jazz or street dance or whatever. But everyone does a bit of everything for the first two years. And then in the third year, you kind of specialise in either contemporary ballet, jazz or musical theatre. And like the whole two years, I was fully like, yep, I'm going into jazz. I'm going to do commercial. Um, that's me. That's what I want to do. And I think it's because I think as a dancer, I'm interested in things like dynamics and um, musicality and mm things like this which I found more in commercial choreography I think I found that more than in Graham <laughs> at that time because that's all I was exposed to um I didn't really know about Hoffesh or all, all these these things that are contemporary that you know that are not <laughs> this so yeah, I, super structured or balletic yeah and like, I don't really have like a typical dancer's body. Like I don't have turnout. I don't have, um, I make it work. <laughs> I have some flexibility, but it's kind of very hard. I, I've worked very hard for flexibility and it's not, and it's not real. It's kind of like, if you look at me in a picture, usually like my body's like crunched over just so I can get like the height of the leg. <laughs> very bad technique. Um, but yeah, so when I was at studios, um, it was just one, a contemporary teacher at the end of my second year. She was like, you know what? You should just try contemporary. And I was looking at her like, what? Are you crazy? Because <laughs> I, was, I was very jazz. Like I had no fluidity. Like everything was like really full out. I mean, I'm still quite full out, but it was like, there was no soft. There was none of that. Yeah. And um and in the end, I just decided to do the contemporary course. I was like, do you know what? I can go to Pineapple, like in my evenings or Studio 68, do my commercial classes. And then I'll just go and get like my good technique from contemporary in my third year. But I'm still going to go into commercial. And um, I think um, actually we had Jose Agudo. So the person that I'm working with now, he came in and he made a piece on us in our third year. And I was suddenly like, ah, like this can be something that like, you can do something that's not Graham and it'd be contemporary. Like mm. there's actually contemporary out there that exists that is like, that has dynamics, that has groundedness, that has groove. And, and these are the things as I was saying that I was interested in, in as a dancer. Mm. And I was suddenly like, Huh. It was like a light bulb, like, hmm, maybe I could do this contemporary thing. And so I just like decided to do a few auditions um, just to get a vibe like, oh, could I could I potentially do this? And I didn't actually book a contemporary job for like a good year after graduating. But I was still kind of doing well in the auditions that I would get to like the last stage. I was like, oh, maybe I can do this like as a career. Mm. So when I graduated, I just took that year to kind of expose myself to as much um, 
as I could that I because I was missing a lot like when I graduated I was not a contemporary dancer still mm. like I still had a lot to figure out so I just took loads of intensives like I did a gaga course and Hofesh courses, Akram, whatever, whatever I could get my hands on, open yeah. class, the place, contact jams. Like I was just trying to learn, like what is this contemporary thing? And um, yeah, a year later, someone decided to employ me, and then yeah, here I am. <laughs> I managed to make I managed to make it work, but I I don't even know if I consider myself like a, a proper contemporary dancer. I, I really consider myself a dancer like yeah. I remember you asking me like how do you want to be referred to as an artist or human being or and I know a lot of, of dancers don't like this term dancer but I actually love it I I'm a very proud dancer like I I am a dancer like mm. I listen to music and I want to move and for me that's like what a dancer is and um yeah like it's so much for you it's so much more than being defined by like a style it's it's really more just like yeah the the, the joy of moving and yeah moving and grooving yeah 100 <laughs> percent. i do remember that actually when when we met when i was like working with jumar and i think it was at south bank and you were raving about the gaga course you'd like just been on oh. you were like oh i just went on this gaga course it was like amazing oh you gotta do it <laughs> <laughs> so it's, yeah. yeah it's good to see like how much it's like yeah it, that has kind of impacted you but also like I think like what you're talking about is really encouraging for other dancers as, as well because in some sense like you're like a, a late developing contemporary dancer although you've been on this dance journey for a long long time and all of that was foundation to help you quickly pick up this style because you wouldn't have been able to be in like, oh, let's become very good at contemporary dance like in a year if you didn't have all of this training just as a you know dancer, like like you say, because so many of those skills are transferable. Not all, but a, a lot of them are. Um, yeah. But I, 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 I always find this encouraging and interesting, these, these kind of dan dancer journeys that Actually, sometimes people have really surprising kind of entryways um, into, yeah, into it. And it's not really always like what you would expect necessarily. And I'm so, I mean, I'm actually really grateful that I didn't go straight into a company or straight into a job because I would have never discovered voguing, for example. Like right. I, it, was, it was in that year that I that I was introduced to ballroom and voguing because I, I wasn't working. I was just discovering, I was just playing, meeting people. Mm. It was great. I was, yeah, learning so much, seeing lots of different styles of dance. And I think it's that's just developed and shaped how I am as a performer now and as a dancer is having is having all these influences from my training from when I was growing up, but also that year really allowed me to find like who am I as a dancer or an artist and yeah yeah and I think I, I wish like more conservatoires and more universities were like honest about that as well you know you're in a structured program with other other people and yes there's pliability and flexibility within those um, kind of education programs but to some degree you are learning a lot of what everybody else is learning and you do always have a period of leaving and then just being like well what next who actually am i and there is sometimes a little bit of like an identity crisis that comes with it as well as like some some identity discovery you know that time of coming away and being going actually what did i take away from that how do i integrate that into kind of you know where i am now you know like when I so like when I did that diploma at Laban, like that was really I looking back, I'm like, I should have done it over part time, like over the two years, like a lot of people did, because I would have been able to ease into it and integrate it into my own style. And what I found was I after I left, I really needed like that year just to be like, who's David the dancer now like you know and to to integrate it into everything that I already had because I jumped from one world into the next and then it was only after I left that I was like how do how do these things actually like kind of coalesce and sit together and 
Um, and just actually just embracing that self-discovery time and that you need time for these kind of ingredients to combine and simmer, you know, to then come out as a kind of more developed, more fully realized dancer. Definitely. Definitely. I mean, I'm still discovering now, like all the time, it's always like I, I love learning and I love learning new things and, and discovering more about myself as a dancer or an artist. Um, so it's never ending. Your body does start to go the other way, though. That's that's the frustrating thing. I'm like, my mind yeah. now, my mind now is so great. Like I feel like I can do so many things, but my body's kind of doing the opposite. So it's this weird balance of like becoming a better artist or a better dancer mentally, but physically, it's yeah. Yeah. While your body feels like a dumpster fire, like yeah. <laughs> more of the time. Yeah. And it's harder to yeah get it to do what you want to. But it does, yeah, it makes you have to be like a smarter dancer in many ways. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Even like when I was doing Rombe 2, that was like, I'd already been th freelancing for three years before. So I was, I was coming into that. A lot of people that I was with doing that, they just come straight out of university. Okay. Um, so there was a big, big difference in like the because way the, the Rombo too is like, uh, for those who don't know, it is like an MA company, right? Like you get a yes, master's as a, a part junior, of being a part of the company. Yeah, it's a junior company. So you work full time as like a dancer in a company six days a week. And then on top of that, you have to do your academic work. But you get, you get, um, yeah, it's like you get, um, assessed on your performances and stuff like this as well it's um, very full on six days a week plus academics i don't think i've ever been so tired in my whole life yeah um like i i, I mean i had to stop completely voguing like that was just wow. not even a thing i mean that's me in general whenever i have like a project or something i have to dedicate my time to that you know get to bed early um you know I just don't have the energy for anything no. else. It is how like work. dance is so different. Like it's not just like a normal nine to five. When you're on project, it is really just like you are on project. <laughs> yeah. And um, I think that's why freelance suits me more. When I was in, I had a great time in Rombe. It's an amazing company, um, company, but for me, I like doing my other things. Like I need to, I need to have a life as well. Like I need to, do things that are not dance I need to see friends I need to do ballroom and stuff like that and I think freelance allows me to do that it's like the best of both worlds I have time to do fay, and then I also when I am working I can dedicate just myself to that and be in that headspace um so yeah so that was the thing with Romba it was full-on six days a week was just <laughs> I don't even know how, to, like, tired is not even the word. Yeah. Like, tired is not the word. I remember there was one show, we had, like, an essay due the next day, so we were writing our essay in the in the interval. And then when we got back to the hotel, like, we, yeah, it was, it was crazy. That's madness. It was crazy. But we were the first year, so they were still kind of figuring out, like, how, right. to, do, how to do it and stuff. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I could tell could tell anybody that six days a week plus academics is not a good idea. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I'm so grateful for that year. Though. I, th I mean, I got to work mm. with like amazing choreographers and and stuff, and I think it was really important to my development as like a dancer. Also, the MA, I loved it. I loved doing the academics, like learning about. I I did mine as I kind of was touching on earlier about. Um, learning styles and like neuroplasticity mm. and like how we learn movement and stuff like this and I, my mind was just like and it's really um fed into how I work now it's like wow. all that research that I do has fed into how I yeah how I work so yeah how has that not, how has it changed the way that you work well I was researching like what's the best way to learn like and how can we master something because I, I was always interested I think when I was at Rombe because it's a rep company so you do so ma many different works all the time and for me that was really hard because I, I like to as I was saying earlier I like to take my time with something like really get into the feeling of a particular style of choreography or a particular way of 
moving. Like I like to be quite authentic. I think that's also coming from, from voguing as well, where you spend so long practicing one style and like you have to be authentic with the movement. Like you can't half do it. So I think like that's it has really, to be in your body. It has to be second nature. Yeah. And I think that's what I found a little bit frustrating with rep companies is that you, you learn a piece that is in a specific style. Um, like we, we had like Ohad Naharin, um, have a piece on us which is very specific and like his dancers specialize in that style and they spend years learning how to do this style and we'd have to learn it in like four weeks or three weeks and I, I just was like yeah I was uh, yeah it, it was hard for me and and that's also why I realized like freelance is more for me because then I can be in companies like with Richard or with Jose where I can specialize in that, you know, I can spend my time doing that rather than jumping between lots of different choreographies. Um, but anyway, sorry, I went a bit off track there. But um, so learning, I, I realized, first of all, that I like specializing and that I am quite a slow learner. And um, I just learn how to learn even though we know how to learn anyways because we've been doing it our whole lives but I just realized what's like the most effective way of learning and the obvious thing is practice if practice makes perfect we know that already but I also realized that um, from the research that um, not everyone will be good at everything or some people won't actually be good at anything <laughs> it's possible that you can practice and practice because there used to be this myth about 10,000 hours. Like if you put 10,000 hours into something, you will master it. Well, that's actually a complete lie. Some people can spend 10,000 hours on something and not be that great at it, unfortunately. So that made me realize, oh yeah, like people, different people, obviously every human is different. We have different genetics, different environments. Um, everyone has different things that they can be good at. And I was like, okay, that makes sense. That's why I want to specialize in something because I feel like I was gifted with certain skills and I should like focus on that. Mm. Um, also in terms of like practice, how you practice is really important. It's important to like, it's better to do like one or two hours of like really focused practice with like a goal rather than doing like eight hours or like five hours of practice where you're kind of like, not focused so for me when I'm training Vogue or whatever I try and be really specific and I I, I do uh, I do like one or two hours and then if I find my brain starts to get tired or whatever I'm like okay fine drop it I'm gonna try again tomorrow and it's more effective to practice like little bits every day rather than doing like eight hours on one day a week mm -hmm. that was like the main thing like athletes for example they don't they don't train like dancers. They don't they don't rehearse eight hours a day because it's actually it's not effective for for training. But, wow, yeah. yeah. So I mean, having so having a goal for uh, the practice. So probably help, helpful to before you know each training session or even before a class, just writing down a goal of what you're going to work on in the in that class, what you're going to try and accomplish. Um, you know, I find that helpful, even if I'm taking something really structured, like a ballet class being like, you know, is there, is there a dynamic? Is there something specific that I work on, want to work on this class? You know, the teacher doesn't even need to feed it to me. You know, you know, maybe my arms are shoddy and I know I need to work on that. You know, maybe my timing hasn't been up and I'm just like, you know, this class, everything else can be, you know, whatever, but my timing has got to be sharp, you know, or, you know, whatever's going on, my arms are going to be on point. Like, you know, I'm going to hone in on those, uh, you know, those shapes or whatever. So, uh, you know, so, okay. So that plus, uh, keeping it to a specific time frame, not just overcooking it. Yeah. Um, and the, the, the regular regularness of it as well. I've been, uh, I've talked about it, you know, uh, on other bits of the podcast, but, um, one of the things that I found from reading a book on sleep is, uh you need that process time having that sleep between each each day allows your brain to uh, transfer things to your muscle memory basically so breaking muscle, up your yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, muscle memory. Breaking things up over uh over the course of of the week and uh you know not doing it all at all at once it allows things to that practice to go into your body sooner and be better incorporated 100 percent. there's so much research on sleep what book are you reading why we sleep yeah 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 why <laughs> I we read, sleep? Yeah. Yeah. it's good isn't it yeah it's so good um but yeah like sleep is a huge thing in learning like I don't get enough sleep, but I know how important it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's, it's, if you want to learn something, like you, getting that sleep is so important. Mm. Um, cannot tell people enough. <laughs> you need to sleep. Um, Don't sleep, people. It's annoying for me because I'm, I'm one of these people that finds myself being creative at like 10, 10 p.m. at night for some reason. Yeah, same. <laughs> I'm yeah. like, all my idea all my best ideas come to me then I'm like why I'm like such a night owl and I always get to yeah same I get to like nine ten and then suddenly I'm like man I really want to groove I really want to move but like exercising before bed is like the last thing that you should do but like you know or cho choreography ideas whatever it is but I always what? find I just have like that burst of creativity towards the end of the day you know but, yeah, uh, it's annoying, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there was there was so many other things that I researched as well. But you have to read my dissertation. There's lots of gems in there. <laughs> there you go. Well, post post this like a blog or something, and we can. Yeah, I mean, it would be nice to write out all my all my stuff actually. Because yeah, I, I, was... I mean, I learned so much about like, oh, okay, this is going to really help my learning and stuff. Just like even for like learning choreography and yeah. Yeah, do it. Write it up as like a like a blog or something and then just tag it on your Instagram. Because all that stuff is so useful. Because I mean I spend I spend a lot of time learning choreography and learning how to grow as a dancer ineffectively. And actually once you learn how to grow as a dancer effectively and your trajectory just starts like going up like you're just like man i wasted so much time like yeah. kind of you know and I, and i was working just as hard then sweating it out i had just as much passion but because i was training in a way that wasn't effective i wasn't growing and it was making me disenchanted with dancing because i wasn't growing you know and actually all i needed to do was you know switch up my routine yeah, change the way that I learn things and you know suddenly you start seeing growth and you're like oh actually no this is worthwhile I am seeing the fruits of my labor so yeah there's definitely something to be said about that working hard thing I think always as a dancer I always was that dancer that really pushed like and I pushed too much and actually sometimes chill like you don't it doesn't need to be eight hours of sweating like pushing to your absolute max like mm. Um, that's something that I realized way too late, way too late. I wish I, I, I saw I it earlier. I would have much less injuries if I'd knew, if I'd known this earlier. And it is, a, it is a bit of a street dance thing because I know b-boys are, are like that as well. And uh, it was doing like an intensive with Harfesh that taught, taught me that, that, that they were like, you don't need to be 100% in your energy for it to look to be 100% in your articulation. They're like, you can articulate 100% and not, you know, bringing everything to bear on it and it will look like just as good, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And the same, like, you don't need to like strain to do something hard, just do the thing that's hard because it's already hard enough. And it was kind of that where I was like, oh yeah, like I'm so used to like b-boying where we like throw so much energy behind every movement that I was like, Oh, I actually don't need to throw all that energy behind it. I can just do it. Like it's already hard enough. My muscles are already working. I'm doing the thing. I don't need to be like, <laughs> like you know. <laughs> you don't need to do extra. Just yeah, do the thing. Work hard, but there's a limit. It's the, you can burn yourself out, and I yeah. think I and think rest is super important. Take a day off. It will help your learning. Yeah. But I think contemporary dance, like, yeah, it taught me how to be, to do difficult things in a relaxed state, which is like so important as a dancer, especially when you're just fatigued all the time.
to be able to actually learn how to dance and move at kind of a low energy and still have it look very effective and incredible but actually just being able to like embrace that and not fight it and just be able to do things from a calm place is actually really important definitely 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 <laughs> this has been such a sick podcast um thank you for for joining us today where can people check you out is instagram best yeah instagram I, I don't have a website. I will at some point, but right now, Instagram, <laughs> at Faye Revlon. Um, I do mainly post more Vogue and ballroom stuff there. I do post a bit of contemporary, but um, you'll mainly see Faye the Vogue on Instagram, but that's fun to, to look at. <laughs> oh. And uh, do, you, do you have any dates yet for um, Richard or uh, Jose Argundo's work? <laughs> So they're both um, touring in the autumn um, mm -hmm. from September. I'm kind of juggling myself going between both oh tours. Oh my goodness. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, but yeah, September, um, Jose, we're going to France. That's the first place we're going, hopefully, if everything COVID works out. And um, yeah, Richard we're going oh I'm doing a show with Richard soon in Milton Keynes like a little pop-up show mm -hmm. um and then we go all around the UK from September onwards awesome oh great I'll link um I'll link uh to those uh events and uh their website so if you want to yeah. check out Faye um uh, in uh, those two two works um coming to a city near you um check out the link and uh yeah go see it go see the work um yeah thanks again and thank you audience um if you enjoyed the podcast hit like and subscribe and we will see you next week thanks david <laughs> <laughs>